Paula. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so um, I do have some uh, slides that I've printed off. I don't know I've got for everyone here. I, I did out 20, so um, I will pass them out. Try not to rush on ahead. Uh, as I don't want you to, you know, spoilers and everything else, you know, so don't rush on ahead to the next slide if, if you can avoid that. Um, I've also got some other bits of, of, of pieces here which I may distribute at the end or to those who are interested. Um, this gives an overview of some of the things I'll be talking about today, plus also some of the research I did in relation to loneliness in, and day centres, okay, so if people want to have a copy of that, that's not a problem. And also I have uh, what is known as the UCLA Loneliness Scale, which is a scale which is used internationally to measure loneliness. I'll not say any more about it today, but again, it might be interesting just to take a copy and have a look at that as to how that, that's actually used. This is actually used by academics and people who research on loneliness, okay? So I've brought those with me. All right. So I'll keep an eye on the time, folks, and try not to go over, all right? I'll try not to be long-winded. Um, Okay, so the three things that I'm hoping to cover today is that we'll look at some definitions and messages from research in terms of loneliness. I'm going to focus a little bit on life course perspective, so look at the fact that uh, one of the things that I was, I was conscious of whenever um, I was thinking about this particular presentation when I did my research as well, is one of the reasons we associate older people and loneliness, we tend to put them together, don't we? We sort of think of older people and we think of loneliness. And we don't maybe think about how loneliness impacts across the life course, or we don't maybe prioritise it so much for other age groups. So we'll look at that for a moment as well at, 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 during the presentation. And then we will focus on what loneliness means to, to older people towards, towards the end, OK? Uh, so it's really about the theoretical background today. So hopefully it's not too, not too heavy for you folks, all right? Um, so these are three definitions that uh, people have, that academics have used in terms of defining loneliness. Um, I'll give you a moment just to, just to read over those. Okay, yeah. Sure. Okay, so uh, Colleen uh, says it's uh, loneliness is a discrepancy between one's emotional and our social needs and wants and the reality of their social experience. Wood 1986 is a sense of lacking someone with whom to share personal experiences. And Baumeister and Leary say that it's not so much a lack of social contact as a lack of intimate connections, okay? So I don't know what you think about those, but it, they uh, emphasize the fact that loneliness is, is distinctly personal. It's about how somebody feels within themselves, okay? And it's a subjective experience which is based on a deficit between a desired level and the quality of contact and the actual experience of contact. So we may look at individuals and think that this person is lonely or this person is not lonely. The stereotype is the person living on their own is lonely. The person who has lots of friends is not lonely. But oftentimes we can find that it's actually the opposite way round, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. Um, and one of the uh, researchers have come across uh, actually identified that those who crave more contact are often those already with above average size social networks. So it, again, it indicates the fact that it can be uh, people with wider social networks, okay? And whenever we think about loneliness, um, loneliness is just one aspect, perhaps, of a continuum of aloneness, okay? And so what I've got up here is sort of five distinct areas which indicate different types of aloneness. Uh, this was developed by an author called Colleen, 1998, okay? And as you can see, it moves from, on the one hand, from alienation, which is a very negative uh, sense of, of aloneness, to solitude, which is typically viewed very positively, okay? So, uh, for example, solitude has been described as a positive form of loneliness, but actually, that, I think that's a little bit inaccurate. It's a positive form of aloneness, I think that loneliness is always a, a, a negative aspect of, of aloneness, okay? So solitude is commonly a, a solitary pursuit. Um, and, uh, and in fact, you know, again, when we're talking about people living on their own, there was one survey done in the late 60s found, found that 90% of those living on their own were perfectly happy to do so, okay? So the reality is, for a lot of people who live on their own, 
uh, they're perfectly happy with that particular state of living um, and uh, loneliness creeps in whenever uh, other things occur which stop people being, uh, I suppose, more independent, okay? Um, so aloneness may be cho chosen, solitude is chosen, solitude is this desire to be on your own and, and maybe seek, uh, uh, I suppose, reflect, time for reflection and seeking higher meaning in things, okay? Uh, and it doesn't contradict a desire for companionship, okay? But uh, loneliness is never chosen, okay? Loneliness is something which is, uh, which is really a, a very negative aspect of our lives, okay? Um, and the one aspect uh, that we may come back to later on in terms of solitude is that solitude, as we said, it's something which is chosen, it's something that we decide to do ourselves, give ourselves a little bit of space and time for reflection and everything else. But there is one aspect of solitude which uh, can be particularly negative, okay? And that's when it is involuntary. And there's been studies that have been done on solitary confinement in prisons. They've come up with some very interesting findings. For example, the idea originally behind solitary confinement in prison is that it allows prisoners to have time for reflection and to develop remorse, you know, to feel bad about what they've done, okay? That's the reason that, that the, you know, people in the past have used for solitary <coughs> confinement. But actually what uh, academics and researchers have discovered is that inmates are more likely to de develop uh, side effects that include anxiety and depression, and also things like hallucinations, paranoia, and psychosis. Okay, so these are direct results of involuntary solitude, of being in solitary confinement, okay? So I don't wanna to say too much more about that at the moment, but just think about the fact that for a lot of older people who um, do not have the choice or the independence to move about freely and are maybe in effect trapped in their own homes, when we think about what solitary confinement research is telling us, it might be interesting to know what, how that impacts upon older people and others who ha are involuntarily living on their own and don't get out of the house too often, for example. Okay? One of the things that you'll find is that oftentimes we use the terms loneliness and social isolation uh, interchangeably. And if you looked at the, the last slide there, you noticed that social isolation was separate from loneliness. And again, I've tried to indicate that it is uh, a separate concept from loneliness itself, okay? Um, if we're talking about loneliness and being a subjective experience about being something that we feel within ourselves, okay? And that nobody else can say that we, we are lonely or we are not lonely, you know, we are the people who know whether we're lonely or not, okay? Social isolation is slightly different because it relates to the concrete notion that you can see people who are socially isolated, okay? It would relate perhaps more to people in, for example, in rural communities who do not get access or do not readily get access to uh, services and maybe uh, find it difficult to, to go shopping and different things like that. And perhaps Patty will say a little bit more about that, that later on. Okay, so it's, social isolation occurs when there is that, that definable sense that we can actually objectively measure the fact that somebody has got a lack of contacts or a lack of, you know, in terms of their network, in terms of the resources and services they receive. Loneliness is very different from that because it's about how they feel within themselves, okay? And as you can see, loneliness in itself is, is, has been broken down by uh, researchers into two terms, into social loneliness and emotional loneliness. And we'll have a little look at these two particular terms, okay? So you can see from the, the slide there that social loneliness um, and emotional loneliness are sort of connected to two different sorts of things, okay? So um, emotional loneliness is really about a keenly felt absence or the loss of a specific close relationship, a relationship which is very important to us and that is absent from us. And then we tend to feel emotionally lonely within at those times. And as you can see there uh, from Drennan et al's research, that it's related to things like widowhood, divorce, and separation. But it doesn't just have to relate to people who are um, life partners, for example. Um, whenever I was doing my research in day centers, I came across a woman in her 60s who had always lived with her mum, and her mum had died recently in, in the last year or two, and she was fe keenly feeling the absence 
of her mum. That was a profound loss to her. And for her, that was about emotional loneliness rather than, say, social loneliness. So it doesn't just relate necessarily to life partners. It relates to the absence of somebody who uh, is a trusted individual, okay, someone who is very close to us. However, social loneliness is really about thinking or the, the feeling of being absent from a, a group of friends or a satisfying social network, okay? So you could say it's maybe quite close to social isolation, but again, social isolation is about the objective state of somebody being absent from friends. Uh, this is about the perception within themselves. Social loneliness is about the perception within yourself that you're absent from friends. So you may actually have friends and seeing friends, but maybe you're feeling, for whatever reason, that there's a lack of connection with those particular individuals, which, which leads you to feel socially lonely, okay? So again, in terms of emotional loneliness, that relates to feelings of abandonment, utter aloneness, anxiety, whereas social loneliness is more related to boredom, aimlessness, aimlessness and also a desire for interaction with others, okay? Um, and the two theories, again, I won't, I won't say too much about this, but the theoretical theories behind these two, for social loneliness, uh, uh, something called cognitive discrepancy, the idea that you don't have enough contacts around you, and for so emotional loneliness, it's attachment, the idea that you have a, uh, that there's a profound relationship that you are missing whenever you feel emotionally lonely, okay? So the interesting thing with that is that um, if you were looking to, for example, try to minimize somebody's loneliness, you probably need to think about what it is that you're trying to actually do. Because actually emotional loneliness, you could probably argue that social interventions are probably going to be less effective for dealing with emotional loneliness, which is about that, that really deep, profound connection with somebody, rather than social loneliness. So it would make more sense if you're doing social interventions with people that you're going to address social loneliness more than emotional loneliness. Although you may find that even, that even in those cases that emotional loneliness can be affected uh, by a social intervention, which is one of the things I actually did find in my studies with day centres. Emotional loneliness was affected. Uh, in some cases, uh, by the social intervention, okay? Okay, so just uh, briefly on these two forms of, uh, another two forms of loneliness, we can think about things called chronic loneliness and then something which is called situational loneliness, okay? So first of all, chronic loneliness. So as you can see there, chronic loneliness relates to something where you're having an enduring dissatisfaction with your relationships uh, for more than two years in length, okay? Um, and they, a, a typically chronic loneliness seems to be related to people who have particular personality traits uh, which may be perceived as being more antisocial, okay? They're individuals who perhaps may be shy, perhaps are perceived to be highly critical, they may be less optimistic, more self-conscious. Um, they, uh, they may lack empathy and they may approach relationships from a position of cynicism, okay? Um, and other people then see them as more caustic, more aloof, less empathetic, and they don't like to be around them so much because they tend to be tricky people to be around or they're perceived to be tricky people to be around. And that leads to what I've called here as the unhealthy paradox, okay? Because for most people who are chronically lonely, they are desperate to make connection with other people. But for whatever reason, they maybe don't have the social insight or the social skills to make those connections. And then they create environments or they, or, or they sort of exude an aura which makes them less attractive to other people. So other people feel they can't approach them. They don't want to approach them. And so it, and it ends up being this horrible cycle where they actually can't make these connections. Okay, so it's quite a... Uh, a tricky and awful situation that some people unfortunately find themselves in. And you can probably see, because uh, one of the things that you're probably conscious of, that, uh, or, or maybe one of the th thoughts that you might have had coming to today is, oh, well, well, what's the difference between loneliness and depression, for example, okay? Uh, well, they're, they're definitely uh, very different concepts, but you can see how being chronically lonely could then lead on to depression, yeah? Because of being stuck in this particular state, okay? So this is where uh, depression kind of emerges when you can't find effective ways 
of being able to overcome and deal with loneliness. Okay, so that's where one of the reasons where, where they can be discrete and separate. Okay. So then to move on to the idea of, of situational factors. Okay, so situational loneliness is actually something which probably all of us have experienced at one time or another. Most, uh, uh, if we went round the room, I'd be very surprised if there wasn't at least if there wasn't uh, any of us who were able to say that we had been situationally lonely at some time or other, some time or other, okay? So it's typically sparked by an event. It may just be a one-off thing that happens in our lives at one point, and then we overcome it, and it's okay, but it makes us feel uh, lonely for that particular point in time. So it's generally not regarded as problematic, okay? However, um, what is interesting is, is sometimes some of the times which can be associated with loneliness and again, whenever you look at research relating to older people, uh, you find that, for example, night times and weekends are sometimes cited as being particularly bad for feelings of loneliness. And also times like Christmas has been cited as being a, a difficult time for loneliness, uh, as it is a time when people expect perhaps to be with others or has been associated in the past as being a time when you've gathered with a lot of other people and perhaps that no longer occurs, okay? So you can see Christmas could be very difficult, okay? Um, and in one study, uh, a participant described nighttime as the nocturnal hours were a time of no escape, okay? So it gives a sense of that real intense feeling of times at, at night being difficult. So uh, nighttime and winter are associated with being shut away and hardly seeing a soul for some particular individual. So we may see those as, work, uh, as being worse. But summertime can be difficult as well for some older people uh, and for others because that can be a time when organizations take a break from providing services. So actually the summer months can also be uh, tipping points for feeling lonely because people during the day, although you may have nice weather and might be able to get out of the house, but during the day you actually may not see too many people from one day to the next because the services you are used to are no longer operating. So that may, be, that may occur for some uh, individuals, okay? All right, we're gonna move on to, to looking at loneliness through the life course, as I said earlier. And the next slide may, may be surprising, may not, maybe not be, I don't know. Um, oh, what happened there? Oh, we've lost the slide, ah. Okay, so, <coughs> oh dear. Um, <coughs> I don't know if you can see that, folks. <laughs> um, if you have the slides in front of you, you'll, you'll notice what we have is, is, a, is a smile, okay? A smile, all right? And what that indicates is actually for what the research actually tells us is that the loneliest time in somebody's life typically is adolescence, okay? So our, our perceptions are that the loneliest time in life, yeah, our, our sort of stereotype is the loneliest time in life is older people. Now, when we get to, uh, well, this is especially related to 75, 80 plus, okay, you are getting towards the same sort of level of loneliness being experienced as at adolescence, okay? But it's still a bit of a stereotype that actually adolescence is the loneliest life stage, okay? As I say, research would tell us that the loneliest life stage tends to be adolescence, okay? So why is that? Well, adolescence is, is all about, um, or adolescent loneliness is all about the transition for the individual from being connected to their family to wanting to be accepted by their peer group, okay? So things like social comparison and expectations of relationships become very, very important to young people. Um, and they begin to misread social cues and experience intense feelings of rejection, which, you know, sometimes are uh, exaggerated perhaps out of all proportion to what is actually occurring, but it's how they feel. They do feel that they're actually being rejected. They do feel that they're the loneliest people, okay? And again, for a lot of uh, younger people, they would feel that uh, they like to spend time on their own, okay? And again, that can be a misconception, you know, this idea of, oh, so-and-so's in their bedroom, yeah? Maybe some of you can relate to having a teenager in the bedroom and not coming down and spending time with the family. But actually that can be quite healthy for an individual's development and that's okay. They usually, if, uh, again, going back to this idea of solitude, they're, they're actually developing their own personality, they're finding themselves. And it's not a time which is associated with loneliness. But there is one time which is associated with loneliness for young people. 
and when they spend time on their own. And that's Friday and Saturday night, okay? That's researchers have found that they actually uh, indicate that they're feeling lonely on Friday and Saturday night. Um, and perhaps the reason is obvious for that is, is that those are the times when it's expected so that you are socialising with other young people in your peer group. But those are the times when suddenly you feel profoundly lonely if you're not doing that. So that's when young people actually um, express loneliness in, in, at, at those particular times. Okay. So interestingly, you know, for older people, the quality of social contact is very important. Whereas for younger people, what the research tells us that the quantity of social contact is actually quite important. All right. Okay. So this next slide again is, is really about our perception of loneliness in later life and again our assumptions. What this indicates is that the younger you are, the more that you associate later life with being a time of loneliness. Okay? So as you can see there, people who are between the ages of 15 to 24 are the highest at saying, oh yeah, these were people who were asked, it's not when, uh, about asking about when they were, lone, uh, if they feel lonely themselves, they're being asked about you know, how do you, uh, do you feel that older people are lonely, okay? So 15 to 25, four-year-olds are saying, yes, we, you know, there's a higher percentage saying, yes, we do think that older people are lonely. Whereas you can see, by the time you get to 65 plus, a, there's, a, there's a fair drop in terms of the number of people who are actually stating that older people are lonely, okay? So there's a misconception within our society about the extent of loneliness within later life, okay? Loneliness is overestimated, okay? And again, this is a range of studies which have looked at the prevalence of loneliness in later life. And basically, if you sort of look at all the factors together, they, they, they're kind of quite consistent that they come out with a, a more or less an average of around about 10% of older people. So one in 10 older people that we could maybe say are often or always lonely, okay? So it's still a significant number, but perhaps it's a little bit lower than perhaps the, the public perception may be. But one in 10 is still a significant number, in my opinion, uh, of older people feeling often or always lonely. And then if you were to add often and always lonely and sometimes and moderately lonely together, you get about 40% of the, the population. So again, you know, it's uh, a fairly high number, I suppose, you know, if you're bringing in the sometimes and moderately lonely people alongside the people who are often and always lonely, 40%. But you still have around about 60% of older people who will say, I'm seldom or I'm never lonely. Okay, so that's, again, that's, that's a positive to, to be aware of. All right. So what time are we on? Um, I think I'm okay for the time. Uh, so I just wanted to talk, uh, before we move on to this discrete area of older people and loneliness, really about differences between perception of loneliness between two people. I don't know if anyone recognises these particular individuals. Uh, the young person on the left is a singer-songwriter called Laura Marling. Some of you may have heard of her. Um, and the woman on the right is a, a very famous diarist and writer, uh, Mae Sarton. And again, you, you may or may not have heard of her. Uh, but Laura Marling uh, described, uh, well, she, she was interviewed by The Observer a couple of years ago and she described loneliness uh, in this sort of way. Living in London, Laura Marling felt increasingly hemmed in, bored by the nightly choice of Netflix or pub, and worried about whether she was giving her friends enough of her time. Touring the west coast of America last year, she felt that if she fancied company, there was always someone to talk to, a bar prop, a local with a story, and then if she preferred to spend time on her own, nobody asked why. If you're someone like me who likes to be alone, but doesn't want to be lonely, Los Angeles is a good place to be. So that's Laura Marling's perspective about being alone and being, lone, uh, being alone and being lonely. And as you can see, there's a lot of choice that she's able to exercise in terms of how she uh, negotiates uh, being alone and, and, and avoiding loneliness, okay? Now, May Sarton is, is very interesting. She wrote eight journals between the years of 1973 and 1994, just shortly before her, her death. Um, and that kind of, it's very interesting reading those because it trying to tracks her journey through uh, later life from the age of 60 to 82. Um, and how she uh, then began to, I suppose her health began to decline and things began to change for her. 
And at the age of 60, she reported about how the fact is that she used to live on her own. She was somebody who, uh, she, she was in a relationship earlier in her, in her life, but then towards her, her, the later end of her life, she, she, she was living on her own, I think, for about the last 30 years of her life. Um, but it wasn't a hardship to her, and she, she lived in a rural location. So at, at age 60, this is what she wrote, I'm here alone for the first time in weeks to take up my real life again at last. That is what is strange, that friends, even passionate love, are not my real life unless there is time alone in which to explore and to discover what is happening or what has happened. Okay? So again, she's saying at the age of 60, she's really valuing the time alone. It's great to be alone. Yes, I love to have spend time with my friends, but thank goodness they're gone. You know, I can be on my own now. Okay? And then contrast this to her last diary. Okay? I am lonely, but people tire of me even after a short visit. The thing that's so hard for me to get used to is that walking across the room demands an effort so often that I don't do something because I don't want to walk across the room. It's as simple as that. Okay? She's, she's not incapa incapacitated to, uh, to a much uh, stronger degree, I suppose. She can't, uh, she's struggling to get across the room. She's struggling to uh, negotiate her own time yeah? and being able to see friends whenever she wants to and be alone whenever she wants to. All right. So this again is older people's loneliness and these are the things which are commonly associated with older people's loneliness. And there's a, a, an academic called Wood who terms uh, older people's loneliness as being consequent to an occurrence. In other words, something has happened which has led on to loneliness. So it's very different from adolescent loneliness in that regard. Okay? So you can see some of the common themes there which would be very unlikely for adolescents, although some adolescents may experience them. Things like bereavement, living alone, depression, uh, decreasing independence, that's a key, key issue, poor physical health, poor mobility, and again, loneliness tends to be associated with increasing age, so the, the older people are, as you saw from the graph we saw earlier, the older people are, the loneliness does seem to, to be an upward curve, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so how, is, how, how, how does this then, so there's one tragedy within this, in, 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 the, in as much as that whenever people become increasingly incapacitated, when, they, when their independence becomes increasingly decreased, we find that actually, they find that their network begins to shrink, okay? So what I've got up here is, uh, this is a, something from Nora Keating, a, a Canadian academic, um, who has uh, looked at social networks across the lifespan, okay? And she estimated that around, throughout your life you have about 1,500 people in your entire social network, which sounds really, really high, but I suppose it's to do with contacts and things like that. And although I say it sounds really high, she wrote this in 2003, this particular model, and now people have been on Facebook, and I'm sure there's people with more than 1,500 friends on their Facebook, you know, so it probably needs to be raised a little bit in terms of the, the approximate number. But these are people with whom you might have contact in some meaningful way or other. It's not people that you know particularly well, but they, you, know, you may have one-off contacts with across the life course. Whereas your personal social network relates to 12 to 20 individuals, and these are people who are important to you and that are meaningful to you, okay? And then whenever we get into these uh, inner circles, these are quite interesting, the support network and the care network, which are much smaller. And these relate to people who will help you in times of need. So the support network are people who will maybe do practical things for you, and your care network are people who are maybe willing to do personal care needs and different things like that, okay? And what you find is, so it should maybe be obvious, is that as you become increasingly incapacitated, your network shrinks, okay? You find that your support network is, is relates to these uh, five to ten people, and the care network, if you really are needing some personal care needs attended to, your, uh, the, the, the number of people that you may see on a regular basis may shrink to down to three to five individuals, okay? So this is a tragedy, unfortunately, uh, with, with some of the... the incidents of loneliness in later life it's related it does relate to the shrinking of network size okay so just to, to finish off then uh, just to come back to one more theoretical concern um, which is I find quite interesting this sort of relates to um, an area which is about evolutionary theory okay um, and it comes from a guy called John Cacioppo from the University of Chicago. He's a bit of a guru in terms of loneliness thinking. Um, and 
basically he says that evolutionary theory says that, that the, the, the whole origins of loneliness is that they extend or they've been described as the primary moving face, sorry, the primary motivating force for humanity, okay? Which might sound, whoa, that's quite, or the desire to avoid loneliness has been described as the primary motivating force for humanity, okay? So, when we think about that, that's quite interesting, or that, that might sound quite profound, or a little bit over the top, perhaps. Um, but this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, so many of you have maybe come across Maslow's hierarchy of needs in the past, okay? Um, and whenever we think about loneliness, I think it's probably quite common that we might perceive loneliness as being within the, the section there that, that relates to belongingness and love needs. And, okay, and some of the things that we've talked about already, perhaps we'd reflect that. The interesting thing about evolutionary theory is that it talks about the fact that loneliness, or, or Cacioppo would say that loneliness de developed in primitive humans as a warning to seek out social bonds for security. And those who responded to this warning were then more likely to survive. Okay, so it was feeling lonely was actually a prompt in our bodies to say, I feel lonely, I need to connect with others. And that helped in terms of survival, okay? So whereas we may perceive loneliness as being related to belongingness and love needs, okay? Cacioppo's, uh, uh, I suppose, thesis would mean that actually loneliness is actually more profound than that in terms of it actually relating to our needs for safety and security, okay, or avoiding loneliness rather, or is, is related to actually our needs for safety and security. So it's actually quite uh, a profound uh, thing to, to want to overcome in, in that regard. And that is the end. <laughs>